joining us. Welcome. Thank you for being here this afternoon. My name is Matthew Menendez with White Plume. Um, we're going to be talking about MIPS specifically, um, what that looks like in 2018. So over the next 45 minutes or so, um, what I want to do is talk about some of the new changes of what we're going to see in MIPS. Um, a couple of the highlights uh, you may already be familiar with. There are new uh, low volume exclusions for MIPS in 2018. Uh, these low volume thresholds existed in 2017, but they have been significantly increased. Um, so that means that some of your eligible clinicians who are eligible in 2017 may not be eligible in 2018. Um, so don't just hit the refresh button on that uh, this year. There have been some significant changes in that part of the program. I'm going to detail those for you. Um, it also may impact how you decide to report, whether you report as an individual or whether you report as a group. Um, so make sure that we will we'll cover that as well. Um, there are uh, the, the performance threshold. That is the score that you have to get to avoid the penalty uh, has increased from 2017 to 2018. Um, it is still a pretty low bar. Um, we're going to talk about that. The new performance threshold is 15. That is the magic number for 2018. Uh, but we're going to talk about that uh, in, in detail for what that means for your practice. Um, the cost measure, this was one that we it was a bit of a surprise. We thought this wasn't going to come in to the program until 2019. Um, that was what was in the uh, proposed rule, uh, but they changed that on us. That was one of the surprises in the final rule. So the cost measure will be there in 2018 where it was not in 2017, um, but there's nothing you have to do to report that data. That's collected uh, through the claims that you're already submitting to Medicare. Uh, we'll jump into that in greater detail so that you understand what that means, what that looks like, what you need to do, uh, but know that the cost measure is the fourth category of MIPS, and that will be included in the program year for 2018 and going forward. We're also gonna spend some time on what types of strategies you can take to make sure that you avoid the penalty, right? A lot of practices always have questions about that that says, what are the, some of the things that I need to do if I want to make sure I don't get a penalty? Or in the CMS language, they call it a negative adjustment. Um, but if you want to avoid the penalty, how do I do that? Um, you can also look at that for those of you who are going for a big bonus. Um, what are some of the strategies I can take to maximize my score? There are some easy places that you can pick up points, and I want to make sure that we talk through that today as well. Uh, again, I'll leave time for questions and answers at the end. So if you have those, feel free to submit them as we go. Uh, Shelly will try to answer as many as she can, and we'll make sure we cover the ones that are broadly applicable for everybody towards the end of the webinar. So real quick, side-by-side -side comparison, what changes in 2017 to 2018? The low volume threshold said, if you bill Medicare for less than $30,000 in Medicare charges, or if you see fewer than 100 unique Medicare patients, you cannot participate in MIPS. Okay, That's, that doesn't mean you can opt out. It means you cannot participate. So for low volume providers, if you don't see a lot of Medicare patients, or if your med total Medicare charges is low, lower than $30,000, you may not participate in MIPS in 2017. In 2018, those numbers have gone up significantly. Now it is $90,000 in allowed Medicare charges or 200 unique Medicare patients, right? If you are below either of those thresholds, then you are not eligible to participate in MIPS in 2018. Um, I, I like examples. Examples are helpful for me. So let's imagine that you're a four-doctor practice. Dr. Andrews, Dr. Bryant, Dr. Campbell, Dr. Davis, all practice together in a group at Main Street Clinic. Now, there is also an exclusion for first year participating in Medicare. See, Dr. Davis is 
this is his first year participating in Medicare. And so that makes him where he's not a MIPS eligible clinician. Let's work up a little bit. Dr. Campbell participated in Medicare previously, saw 150 unique Medicare patients, but only billed Medicare for $80,000. And so was not over the 90,000 threshold and therefore cannot participate in MIPS. Dr. Bryant saw 400 unique Medicare patients, no Medicare for $105,000, and so is required to participate in MIPS. He is a MIPS eligible clinician. And then Dr. Andrews did not meet the volume threshold for unique Medicare patients. That is why he is ineligible to participate in MIPS. So we've got a decision. Dr. Bryant is the only eligible clinician by himself. If he wants to participate, he must participate in MIPS. The other three may not participate in MIPS as individuals. However, as a group, under one tax ID, they have seen 900 unique Medicare patients and 430 unique Medicare charges and therefore must participate. So if they want to participate as a group, all of their data will be reported for MIPS. So Dr. Bryant must participate. If they, if they decide they want to do it all individuals, Dr. Bryant is the only one who will be participating in MIPS in 2018. If they want to report as a group, they will all be participating in MIPS. So you may, if, if you looked at the low volume threshold for 2017, you may want to review that again for 2018 because those changes are significant. <clears throat> One of the largest changes that we talked about was the cost measure. That was not in the 2017 program. It is in the 2018 program, but it is one of those that is very difficult to calculate in advance what your score will be. There are two cost measures that we're gonna talk through. I'll go through the details of those with you. but that is a very difficult thing to calculate in advance. All right, now the performance threshold, these are what points you need in order to avoid the penalty or be eligible for the exceptional performance bonus dollars. Most people will fall between 15 and 70 points on their final MIF score. But those that are under the 15, are subject to the penalty. Now the penalty in 2017 was 4%. For next year, that will be 5%. That will continue to increase as we as they continue to roll out the program. Um, but we do not expect, based on where the performance threshold is set, that there will be very many people who actually receive the penalty. Medicare is projecting less than 4% of eligible clinicians will be subject to the penalty in the 2018 program year. And the good news is everybody on the webinar today should have an easy path to avoiding the penalty in 2018. And remember, the MIP score in 2018 does not impact your reimbursement until two years later. So the earliest anybody will see this type of penalty is 2020. Uh, you remember last year under pick your pace, um, you could really report for just a 90 day period. Uh, they have lengthened the reporting period for this year for the quality measures of up to 12 months. Uh, but uh, as long as you meet the data completeness criteria, um, you, you can do a shorter reporting period and still avoid the penalty. All right, so we're gonna talk about that as well. The other new things for 2018 is there's a small practice bonus 
one of the complaints uh, that, that a lot of people voiced to CMS about the QPP program was that small practices are at a disadvantage. They don't have a lot of the same infrastructure that the large organizations have, and they still are competing with them from a MIPS final score perspective. So small practices defined as less than 15 clinicians get five bonus points right off the bat, right? Just by virtue that they are, as Medicare defines it, a small practice, they get those five bonus points. So small practices on the phone today, that is good news for you, right? That means you're a third of the way there towards avoiding the penalty just by virtue of your size. Now there is also bonus points available up to five bonus points for dealing with complex patients. Now I know everybody probably deals with complex patients uh, in their practice, some probably more so than others, but the way that that's being calculated, for those of you who have been on other webinars with us before, they are looking at the patient's risk score as defined by the HCC score to see who has the sickest patients. So if, if, you, if you need a refresher on that, um, feel free to let us know. We're gonna talk a little bit about that because that comes into play in the cost measure as well. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. But if, if you want a more uh, detailed refresher on HCC and risk-adjusted coding um, we, we've got that information for you. We can send you the, the webinar that we've done on that. Uh, we can also help you with some of the HCC analysis. If you want to circle back to that, see where we are um, and where there may be some areas for improvement from an HCC coding perspective. There are some bonus points available there and the cost measures are risk adjusted also. So just from an overview perspective, those are some of the big changes that are coming in 2018 during the program year. So let me give you the reminder of how this works. When we talk about negative adjustments and positive adjustments, we talk about penalties and bonuses, everybody is gonna get a final MIPS composite score, that's what, what they call it, a MIPS composite score of zero to 100. So it's like going back to college, taking a course, you're going to get a grade of 0 to 100, and you're going to be graded against your peers. So CMS states what the performance threshold is. That is the line that says everybody below that line will get a penalty. Everybody above that line will get a bonus. Now, that penalty or bonus does not come into effect until two years later. That's when you start to see that adjustment. Now, for people who get a really, really good score over the exceptional performance threshold, which was at 70 last year and stayed at 70 for this year, for, or for 2018, next year, they will get a larger bonus. Basically, the higher your score, the higher your bonus. The lower your score, the larger your penalty. Make sense? Now, the, the tricky part of all of this is remember the total adjustments are revenue neutral for Medicare, right? I, we've, we've been through this before. What that means is the total dollar amount of the penalties must equal the total dollar amount of the bonuses paid out. So Medicare is not paying anyone. All they are doing is taking money away from the doctors who get bad scores and giving it to the doctors who have good scores and causing a lot of headaches in the middle, I might add, as an editorial comment, right? I know this is, you know, this is math and some, a lot of people don't like math. So let me try to give you an example that helps make this a little bit easier. You remember my uh, emojis? They, there are two practices in the entire country, my practice and then the practice down the street, practice A. We did a great job preparing for MEPS, we got a score of 70. They did not, they didn't do anything, right? You've got to really work hard to get a zero 
in MIPS, but they did. So they get the penalty, and they're not going to be happy about it. That hurts coming off your top line, but we get that bonus. Yay, we're pretty happy about that. All right, now let's assume there are more than two practices in the country, right? Safe assumption. So let's add practice B to the mix. Now they also got a zero. They also pay the 4% penalty. Now for me, that is good news because my bonus is not capped at 4%. My bonus actually is now 8%. And the reason why is they took the 4% from practice A and they took the 4% from practice B and they gave all of that to me. And life is good. But wait a minute. What if practice B ups their game? What if practice B, they get a 70 also? You know what that means? I can't get that 8% adjustment because I'm now splitting that with practice B. All Medicare did was take the 4% from practice A. And they've got two people that they need to give that to, me and practice B. So we both get a 2% bonus, which is not quite as good as the 8% that I got before, even though I did nothing different. So when you start to think about how your practice is impacted by MIPS. It's not just how well you do, but it's how well everybody else participating in the program does. And it's not just about percentages. <coughs> Let me show you one last slide on this that I think helps bring the point home. If practice A is a very small practice and they don't bill Medicare very much, you know, their total penalty is yes, it's still 4%, but it's only $4,000, right? 4% 4 of the $100,000. So they're not gonna be very happy about that, but that is not a game changer for them. But for me and my group, we're a little bit larger. We have some more resources. We did some better planning, but the total dollar amount that we receive only comes from the practice who didn't do so well. And so when you look at that on a per clinician basis, what we get, it looks like we may have done a lot of hard work for not very much upside. And, and that's the thing that, that is projected to happen this year and next year as well. It says when you look at what happens when you do this distribution, Medicare expects less than 4% of eligible clinicians to score less than a 15 next year. And the average penalty will be less than $1,200. And so what that tells you is there aren't a lot of losers in this game. There aren't a lot of people that are not doing well, at least as well as the 15 performance threshold. And that means there aren't, that means there are a lot of people that scored over 15, and there are not a lot of dollars for them to share. So the projected average bonus for, that you'd see in 2020 based on your <clears throat> 2018 performance is less than $350 per clinician. Now, there is a set aside $500 million that's available to be split by the practices that score greater than a 70. But again, it's expected to be split amongst a lot of individual clinicians. And so I see a lot of people whose strategy is it's more penalty avoidance than it is chasing the bonus. Now you, you may want to score better than a 15, but I see a lot of practices, a lot of individual providers who say, you know, I, the strategy we're going to take is you know, how do I avoid that penalty? Now, you remember last year, you had a, a lot of different things you could do to avoid the penalty, right? One improvement activity, one um, quality measure, or the five, the five core parts of advancing care information. You've got some options again this year, and you've got more choices than this, but let me just show you some of the most straightforward uh, processes.
processes to avoid the penalty in 2018 and get the 15 points. You can submit a maximum of six quality measures. And if you pick six, even if you don't score well on any of those quality measures, as long as you do the bare minimum on each of those, you will avoid the penalty entirely. You can do it with just one category. Even if you're a large practice, you can make that work. Or you can do two of the improvement activities. Two of the high weight, you know, another flavor of that would be four of the medium weight improvement activities. You can score in just that category and get more than 15 points. We'll get right at 15 points. You put those two together, it's, it's a pretty easy path to getting 30 points. And so I always get this question, even for a very small practice who does not have an EHR, you can still avoid the MIPS penalty in 2018. Another way is for some of the smaller practices, if you wanna do the core measures within the ACI, those five core measures that should be available in just about any EHR that you use, and you get your five small practice bonus points, you can avoid the penalty that way as well. So remember, you've got a lot of different choices of how you want to pick and choose the categories and the measures that make the most sense for your practice, make the most sense for your providers, that make the most sense for your patients to make sure you get the 15 points to avoid the penalty. All right, so let's look, just a quick reminder from a high view perspective. We only had the three categories last year, quality improvement activities, ACI. In 2018, we're gonna add in the cost measure. The cost measure will be 10% of your final score which takes away some of the weight from quality. Eventually, by the time we get to 2020, we'll have 30% of your score coming from cost and 30% coming from quality. Those will be weighted equally. And that will always be a total of 60% of your final MIPS score. Remember, that's what CMS really cares about under the, this program, under QPP, they really care about cost and they really care about quality. And that's where the majority of your score comes from. Now, if you get if you get all of the improvement activities category squared away, you can see you'll you'll still get your you can get up to 15 points in that category. Uh, if you wanted to do just advancing care information, uh, that's the old meaningful use. You could get up to 25 points in that category. So any individual category. Uh, that we that carried over from last year, in, in just that category, you can get enough points to avoid the penalty in 2018. So again, let's jump into the details uh, real quickly on each of these categories. Um, I'll move quickly through advancing care information because it's very similar to last year. You know, you've got those five criteria for the base score. That makes up half of the points in this category. So 12 and a half total MIPS composite points are available just by doing these base criteria. If you want to more fully participate in this category, there are additional measures that you can pick and choose from. These are menu options. Uh, the more you do, the better you do, the more points you get, um, but you do not, you're not required to do all of these. Uh, if you want to get any points from this category, you are required to do the five items you see on the left-hand side of the screen for the base score. And again, you can get up to 12 and a half points right there. So if you're a small practice, you use an EHR, you wanna get, you do the five base measures and you, under this category, and you get 12 and a half points for that, you add your five bonus points, you're at 17 and a half, you will receive a very, very small bonus in 2020 but you will, avoid, you will effectively avoid the penalty, okay? Remember, that's 25% of your final score. Now, 
let's move to the next category. Let's take a look at improvement activities. So if I want to take a look at improvement activities, uh, this one's a little bit different. Um, full participation, right? So the maximum that you can do is four medium weight activities or two high priority activities. And yes, because I know I'll get the question, you can do two medium and one high priority activity. You can mix and match. Now there are many, many, many to choose from. And again, if, you're, if this category is new to you for 2018, we've got the full list that you can choose from. Uh, we've already downloaded that from Medicare and formatted it in a way that, that we think makes a lot more sense than what you see on the CMS website. But they have these eight different domains and each of them have both high priority and medium priority activities that you can choose from. If you are participating in MIPS as a group, as long as one provider in the group is doing that activity, that counts for the whole group. Okay, so if you're a multi-specialty practice and you say, ooh, one of these activities, one of these improvement activities we're already doing in our family practice group, awesome. You can use that as the improvement activity for the entire tax ID, right? That is good news. So one of the things that I've seen some groups do is they will look at all those improvement activities and they're looking for things that they're already doing or they're looking for things that are on their short-term strategic plan. This is something that we want to do anyway for our practice. We think it makes sense for our patients. It drives value for them. Let's do that because if I can find two high priority activities that meet that description, again, an easy way to avoid the penalty in 2018. If you're going for a high score in 2018, again, that's an easy way to get all of the available 15 MIPS points in the improvement activity category. So a couple of examples, we've looked at these before, um, collecting and following, following up on patient experience, right? Patient satisfaction scores, patient satisfaction surveys. Many of you may be doing this already. You know, are we providing 24 seven access? Do we, do we have a, a nurse line where some, you know, you've got a clinician that has real time access to the patient's medical record? Many of you are probably doing that as well. Those are two high weight activities. Another one, do you have appointment slots available for new Medicaid patients? Right, this is about patient access, making sure that they have access to care. That may be something that your practice is already doing or is considering in the near future. Make sure that you get credit for it. Another one is the CAPS questionnaires. If you're doing that already, another place to get a high weight activity. The most popular reporting mechanism for this improvement activities category is attesting. It's attestation. You don't have to submit any data. All you're doing is verifying um, that your practice is indeed doing these improvement activities. Now you certainly want to make sure that you've got the documentation to back that up in, in the case that you were audited. But the, the, the burden on practices in the improvement activities category is relatively low, particularly if they're things that you're already doing or that you are already planning to do. So I think the improvement activities uh, category is, is some low hanging fruit for some of the groups out there. So let's get to the two biggies. Uh, quality is still half of your total score. So for those of you who want to go for a larger bonus, you're gonna have to score well in the quality category. Uh, for those of you who are looking to avoid the penalty, it's a very easy way, particularly for those of you who reported quality measures in 2017 or have participated in PQRS before that, uh, it's a pretty simple, straightforward way to avoid the penalty or to rack up some good points. And then the cost measure, uh, because it is going to be increasing over the next couple of years and because it's new, we're going to spend a little bit of time on that. 
uh, today, but I would not recommend that as a strategy of how do I avoid the penalty through just through the cost measure? Because number one, it's only 10 points out of the total this year, which is not enough to avoid the penalty. And number two, it's, it's the hardest one to project what my score will be before the end of the year. Um, so let's take a quick look at the uh, cost measure. So it is new for 2018, it is 10% of your score, and there are two different cost measures that everyone will report on for this year. Now the good news is you do not have to report anything. They are calculating this off of claims data. But I kid you not, the two measures are Medicare spending per beneficiary and total per capita cost for all attributed beneficiaries. That makes a lot of sense, right? Everybody got it? Yeah, me too. So it was, I had to do a little bit of research on this. So I'm gonna to try to explain it as, as clearly as I can, but almost everything that I've read and everything that I've found has said, listen, this is difficult to project going forward because of the way that they're doing same year benchmarking. And so they don't know, it's like a, a professor who grades the test on a curve. You don't know going into the test how well you have to do to get an A because part of that depends on how everybody else does on that test and nobody's taken it yet. Does that make sense? Um, or at least you understand if, if it doesn't make sense, the same year benchmarking makes that very, very difficult. One of the best things that you can do if you've not already is review your QRUR reports. Um, you look at the 2017 mid-year report, um, you'll see how you were doing on that so far, how your providers were doing uh, compared to their peers from a cost measure. Both of these measures have been in the QRUR report for several years now. So those of you who are familiar with the value-based modifier and have been looking at your QRUR reports, this should make a little bit more sense to you. Uh, for those of you who have not done that, it would be, that's probably the best place to start for understanding where you are today. And that's probably the best indicator for where you will be going forward, all right? Uh, but if, if, you, if you're looking for other things that you can do to help maximize your points in this particular category. Um, I would say accurately documenting and coding comorbidities are, are going to be big drivers as far as making sure you get the risk adjustment done correctly. And then anything that can be done to minimize cost, particularly hospital admissions or expensive procedures, is going to help on that measure as well. So let me try to explain the two cost measures, because when I first read those, they looked like the same thing to me. So Medicare spending per beneficiary. What this means is they are going to, they're gonna standardize it, they're gonna, they're gonna make sure it's equal for each specialty. It's risk adjusted, which means they are controlling for patient acuity. So they're not gonna hold people with really sick patients to the same standard that people within the same specialty who have relatively healthy patients are held to. But they're gonna look at both inpatient and outpatient claims, so total dollars spent, take the prescription drugs out, but around a hospital admission. So under the inpatient prospective payment program, there are certain admission criteria that they're looking at that, that put it into this category, and they're looking at the claims from three days prior to the admit date, all the way through the admission and discharge, and 30 days post-discharge, right? So a lot of that, a lot of that comes from what is spent from a facility and professional fee side during the hospital stay, and then also the follow-up care post-discharge. So again, making sure that patients are not readmitted, or at least not readmitted more than your peers. And then the risk adjustment part of that is critical as well, because if you're not accurately showing how sick your patients are, that bar will be artificially high for your practice. It will be very difficult to score well. 
That's the first measure, Medicare spending per beneficiary. And believe it or not, it's actually the easier one to understand. Uh, the second one, total per capita cost. And here's the key for all attributed beneficiaries. Right? What this means is, the, the simple part is, it's really just the average total spent per patient. Right? But only for the ones that are attributed to your tax ID. And that attributed is the key word. Right? How do you decide which tax ID, which practice gets assigned that patient expense? So they, they have something that's called two-step attribution, all right, to really define what that looks like. All right, so the, the first step, step one, is did the patient receive primary care services during that period of time? And what that basically means is did they – did a, a primary care physician, so they, they've got a list of defined specialists uh, or, or, you know, internal medicine, uh, family practice, pediatrics, that did they bill an E&M during that period? And if so, if that patient saw somebody who is determined to be a primary care physician, then the tax ID with the most E&M services is the one that gets that patient attributed to them. And they even have a provision for if it was a tie. What the, the person who gets attributed that patient cost for the entire year is the person who saw them last. Right? So if you had a primary care physician, you saw them twice in the first half of the year, then you switched and saw a new primary care physician twice in the second half of the year, the new primary care physician gets the cost for that patient for the whole year. If that patient saw the primary, old primary care physician twice in the first half of the year and then had a new primary care physician who they only saw once in the second half of the year, the old primary care physician is the one who is attributed that patient. Now, specialists, you may think you got off the hook on this because you're, you're not a primary care physician, but that's where step two comes into play. So if a patient was not seen by a primary care physician during the year, then the tax ID who provided the most E&M services is the one who that patient is attributed to. And so the, you can see where the complexity comes into this part of the program. It'd be, think, think about your practice, think about your patients. Do you know which of them have seen another provider for more E&M codes this year than you have. It's very hard to do this, and you may not know the answer until the end of the year. Even if you had complete data, you, you wouldn't know the answer till the end of the year as far as who's seen them the most and did they see a primary care physician, right? Because they could see somebody at the very end of the year in an urgent care practice. And, you know, because they, they got the sniffles at Christmas time, and all of a sudden that urgent care tax ID is the one that gets that patient attributed cost for the entire year. Right? What if that patient that I just described who went on, went on vacation, went to go see their fam, extended family at Christmas time, and they had had an expensive inpatient stay in March? Right? They hadn't seen their primary care physician because they had a, you know, they maybe they had a hip replacement. 
if that was their only primary care visit for the year, the urgent care clinic gets the cost for that patient for the total year. So the two-step attribution process is complicated, confusing, and very hard to predict. So I, I hope I made that a bit clearer. Hope I didn't make that worse. Um, but I, I think the point that I would emphasize there is the best thing that you can do is make sure you're going to get your points elsewhere. Don't count on the cost measure points because it's very hard to predict. Number two, familiarize yourself with QRUR. That'll give you some insights and show you what's happening actually in your practice with your data. And then number three, make sure you are documenting and coding those comorbidities. So for the patients that are assigned to you, that they are accurately handled under risk adjustment. Because that HCC coding becomes very, very important there. All right? So we've talked about advancing care information. We've talked about the improvement activities. We've talked about the cost measure. The biggie is still quality. And there are some changes to the quality measures for this year as well. Um, so for quality, uh, if you want to do full participation, that is six measures. Um, you can report more, but only your top six will be scored, all right? There are many, 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 many options to choose from across all six domains. Again, choose the ones that are relevant to your specialty, choose the ones that are relevant to your practice, but I would tell you that you've got to think about what you choose. But that is very important that you choose well, if, particularly if you're going for a bonus, right? A lot of the measures are the same as they were under PQRS, but in PQRS, it was really a pay-for-reporting program. As long as you reported the data, um, you were going to avoid the penalty. Under MIPS, the quality measures are scored. They are scored compared to your peers, right? And they are 50% of your total score. That means there are 50 out of the 100 points are coming through this category. It is impossible mathematically impossible to get to 70 without doing well in the quality score. Make sense? Any of the other categories, you can ignore altogether and still get to 70. But you cannot get to 70 without the quality. <coughs> now, I did say you can report more. They are graded against the benchmarks. But we know what those benchmarks are in advance, okay? And you get between three, you get a score between three and 10 points within the category on each individual quality measure. All right, so the way that that works, let's say that you get a three on each individual quality measure. You didn't do very well, that's okay. You get three times six is 18, right? And then that you got an 18 out of 50 as your total score, right? Doesn't sound very good. That's 36%. Okay, so you got a 36% in that individual category. But here's what that means. That 36% has a weight of 50 in your final score. And that means your total score for MIPS would be 18. Okay, so there are, even if you choose six measures, you report on six measures, but you don't do a great job in your scoring, you can still avoid the penalty in 2018. Okay, I think that is by design. Now, another change to the quality measures in 2018 says if you choose a measure that is, quote, topped out, your best score you can get is seven. Right, so for the groups, for the groups that are thinking about trying to score really well, you don't want to choose topped out measures. And for the groups who want to score really well, you want to think about which measures are easier to score well in, because there are some that are easier than others. 
if you look at some of the most popular quality measures, at least what was chosen as most popular under PQRS, um, some of those measures are becoming topped out and becoming very difficult to score well in. Right? A lot of people were doing measure 130, measure 226, documenting current meds, tobacco screening and cessation. You have the two most popular measures by far. You can see that in the data. But when you look at the benchmarks, for those particular measures, you can see even if you score over 80%, you can still be only getting three points for those measures. Let me explain what, what you see here. You see there are three different reporting mechanisms for this measure. You can do a registry QCDR, you can report through your EHR, you can report through the claims mechanism, but the different mechanisms have different benchmarks, and the benchmarks are based on past performance within these quality measures. So the, the bottom point here, three points, means you are in the bottom 30% of everybody who's ever reported on that measure from a scoring perspective. The next decile means you're between the 30th and 39th percentage, that means you get four points. The next decile, you get five points. The next decile, you get six points. And so what's happening in 2018 says, if you choose this quality measure, it doesn't matter how you report it, this measure is topped out and the maximum points you can receive, even if you got 100%, is seven. Seven points. So you're you're shortchanging yourself as far as the total points you can get in this category. Okay. And instead of being able to get the full 50, your maximum points from a quality perspective would be 35. Okay. Tobacco use, screening, and cessation. You can see that's topped out on the claims, but you can still get the 10 points. Reporting through an EHR or reporting through a registry, um, you can see you've got a score a little bit better uh, on the registry to get the same points that you would get reporting through your EHR. Uh, that's not always the case. Um, another popular measure, Measure 131, uh, you cannot report through an EHR. That's not supported through EHR reporting. If you wanted to do that one, you would need to report through a registry. And you have to choose the same reporting mechanism for all of your quality measures. So if you really, really wanted to do measure 131, then you would need to make sure that you're reporting through a registry or through claims uh, for all of your quality measures. Uh, let me do one quick example because I think it's helpful to take a look at from a quality measure perspective, understanding the scoring and how it works. Um, let's look at measure one, uh, measure 14. All right, if you go look up, we've got this in an Excel file. If you want to see what all the measures are, uh, we have that for you. But you can see the description of what it looks like. So let me give you the real life example. Let's imagine that I've got my total patient population here. Right, these are all the patients that we see in my ophthalmology practice. So the first thing we have to do is look at the measure and see which patients are eligible based on the measure description. So the first thing that I'm doing is saying, okay, it's, got to, it's only for patients that are over the age of 50. So immediately that says there are certain patients that are under that that are not eligible for this measure. The next criteria says that they have a diagnosis of macular degeneration, age-related macular degeneration. So again, there are other people who fall out of that criteria. And what that means is that I also have to have seen them once this year. And so that, that may remove a couple of other people who are in that subset that I haven't seen this year. What that means is I've got, now I have my subset of patients who meet the eligible criteria for that particular measure. So that means my denominator in this example is 23 patients who are over the age of 50, have a diagnosis of age-related macular degeneration, and have been seen at least once in the practice in the past 12 months, or in this calendar year. Okay? 
That's my denominator. Then I look at what is the quality measure asking us to do? It wants to know how many of those had a dilated macular exam that we, that in, and we documented whether there was presence or absence of macular thickening or hemorrhage and the level of macular degeneration severity. So we had to do the exam and make sure we documented those elements. All right, so I've got a couple of answers. I can say, no, we did not do that, but the patient just refused. They would not let us do the exam, and I've got that documented. So I don't get penalized for that. That patient actually falls out of my denominator. If I had a good medical reason for not performing the exam, that patient falls out of, those patients fall out of my denominator. So instead of having 23 eligible patients, I really only have 20. And then the only other answers are, no, I didn't do it, and I didn't document a good reason as to why we didn't do it. Or, yep, we did it, and we documented it, and there were 18 of those. So now I've got my numerator, and I've got my denominator, and that can give me my individual score for this particular measure. It's the percentage of this. So to get the percentage, I take the numerator, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide it by the denominator, and 18 divided by 20 for all those math whizzes out there, 90%. So we got a 90% quality score on measure 14. So when I look at that and compare it to the benchmark, right, I would have gotten five points out of a possible 10 for reporting through the registry, and I would have gotten three points out of a possible 10 if I reported via claims. I'm sorry, three points out of a possible seven reporting via claims because that's a top that measure. I, didn't, I couldn't ever get 10 points on that, um, on that side. So I, I hope the, me the message that I'm leaving you with this afternoon is there have been some incremental changes. Yes, they, the target performance threshold increased from 3 to 15, but it's not as high of a bar as it sounds. Medicare is expecting fewer than 4% of eligible clinicians to have a score less than 15 next year. So probably nobody on this call who's paying attention should receive that type of penalty. There are some easy steps you can take if you want to get a score of 15 or higher. There are a lot of options and a lot of flexibility if you want to score really well. I would encourage you to, on the cost measure, get your QRUR report, make sure you're documenting and coding comorbidities. If you need help with that, let us know. There's a lot that we can do within our white plume product set that'll help you with that. And for the quality measures, make sure you're choosing well which measures you're going to participate in. Particularly if you want to score well, um, you need to be making sure you're not choosing top out measures. You need to make sure you're taking advantage of the best reporting methodology and that you're choosing quality measures that make sense for your patients and make sense for your doctors. I know I covered a lot, a lot, a lot of information. I can see Shelly busy typing over there during the webinar. Um, so I know she's been answering a lot of the questions that have come in. Uh, feel free to continue to ask any other questions that you have. Uh, we'll, we'll answer as many of those as we can. Uh, if you'd like a copy of the slides, if you would like a link to the recorded version, you can let us know that in the questions panel as well. And as always, there's the short three-question survey on how we did today. How was the content? How was the presentation? Was it helpful for you? Was it awful? for you. Let us know. Uh, any feedback is better than no feedback. So if there are things that we can do better, um, I read every single one of those and uh, greatly appreciate uh, your feedback so I can make these webinars better um, going forward.